This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Haymarket Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is The New Authoritarians, Convergence on the Right by David Renton. While some argue that we are hurtling toward fascism in a replay of the 1930s, and others insist there is little substantial change from politics as usual, Renton takes a different and more nuanced view. In country after country, under the clouds of economic austerity and post-9-11 Islamophobia, we have seen a convergence between traditional conservatives, the authoritarian far-right, and previously marginal fascists. The result is a new, still emergent, and deeply troubling form of right-wing radicalism, at once more moderate than classical fascism in its political strategy, yet indulgent of the racism of its most extreme components. Elaine Heffernan of the Anti-Nazi League called the New Authoritarians the best available account of today's far right and how we can stop it. The New Authoritarians, Convergence on the Right, by David Renton, out now from Haymarket Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. You can trace the fault lines of mainstream politics by identifying where people stand on Palestine. Palestine matters first and foremost, of course, because Palestinian liberation and putting an end to Israeli atrocities matter. But Palestine also offers an unparalleled window into the politics of U.S. foreign policy and the state of geopolitics as a whole because it is a critical node of both empire and of a reactionary regional alliance linking the Gulf states, Egypt, and Israel. Any Democrat who refuses to break with U.S. orthodoxy on Israel is guaranteed to serve the orthodox foreign policy order and destined to abide by the dictates of the national security state inside the Beltway blob. Notice that establishment liberals don't want the Democratic primary to focus on foreign policy. Indeed, they never want foreign policy to be politicized at all. Foreign policy can't be part of politics because it must be the exclusive purview of an unholy alliance of decorated generals and tiny desk think tank warlords. And so in a sense, progressive except for Palestine is a bit of a misnomer, because any politician who supports Israeli settler colonialism likewise supports empire as a whole. If Palestine is an exception, then it is one that proves the rule and who rules. We must demand that politicians break from U.S. orthodoxy on Israel. It's a litmus test that is both just and comprehensive. My guest today is Noura Erekat, and she has an incredible new book out that tells the history of settler colonialism in Palestine from just before the British mandate through the present by way of international law. Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine. Palestine has always served as a lens through which to examine the world, and Erekat does just that in this book, placing Israeli settler colonialism and the Palestinian struggle for liberation in the context of European colonialism, third world decolonization, and U.S. empire building, amongst other things. Before we get started, you probably won't be surprised to hear that I spend a ton of time preparing for each interview on this show. I can only do that because The Dig is my full-time job, and that, in turn, is only possible because listeners just like you listening right now support us at patreon.com slash the dig. 
That allows me to take care of my own financial existence and also to pay a bunch of other people and for a bunch of other things that make this show possible. That's why we don't withhold any episodes behind paywalls. We are committed for political purposes to sharing the analysis provided by people like Nura to as many people as possible, regardless of your ability to pay. Plus, we have great left-wing books to send supporters who contribute $10 or more a month as a thank you. And so if you're listening right now and you can afford to support us and have not gotten around to it yet, please do so at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Thank you. Here's Nura Arakat, a Palestinian human rights attorney and professor at Rutgers, New Brunswick. Her research includes international humanitarian and human rights law, refugee law, national security law, settler colonial studies, and critical race theory. She is a co-founding board member of Jadalia Ezein, an editorial board member of the Journal of Palestinian Studies, and the author of Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine, out now from Stanford University Press. Nura Arakat, welcome back to The Dig. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for having me. There is a pessimistic account that says international law is irrelevant, aside from maybe the work that it does to mystify reality, because it has, in fact, been the real politic balance of power that has seemed to dictate each and every moment in the history of Israeli settler colonialism and the Palestinian struggle against it. But nonetheless, you write, quote, few conflicts have been as defined by astute attention to law and legal controversy as this one. You argue, in other words, that the law indeed matters quite a bit in Palestine, but not in the way that naive liberal appeals to the law might suggest. Rather, you write, quote, the law is politics. Before we get into a lot of historical detail, explain this general argument that you're making. You know, there's this there's this approach that we have as outsiders looking in into understanding legal practice. And there's one of two approaches that also aligns with different schools of thought uh, in thinking about legal theory. And on the one hand, there's this approach that law is lofty. It's an objective arbiter, and you can appeal to it, and somehow, based on an internal legal logic, that it will some sort of balance of fairness will be produced. On the other hand, the cynic is going to look at that same approach and say, you know, that same balance and say, well, that's not true. The law isn't doing anything. What really is is deciding, you know, outcomes is power. And it's it's power uh, makes right, might makes right. And if law is doing anything as you described, it is a legitimating veneer for that kind of violence. And so, you know, I'm looking at this as somebody, as a scholar, advocate. And the scholar in me is really interested in how the law works. And the advocate in me won't accept pessimist approach uh, because it's too fatalistic. It's it's the end. It spells out the end. So it was that search for, well, what is it that led me to, to this answer that I provide, which is that we can agree that the law is politics, but it doesn't always serve the most powerful. It can serve progressive causes. It can serve marginalized communities. It can be leveraged for emancipatory purposes as long as it's done in the sophisticated service of a political movement so that we can understand the law like the sail of a boat. It, you, know, you need the sail to move. But the, on its own, it doesn't decide the direction of what it's going to move in. It's the political movement that decides direction. And I, understanding that approach and appreciating it, then insist, draw the sail when it's harmful, 
raise it when it's useful, and create new law when possible. So just to take it a step back, you know, some people are still not convinced, but isn't that the same as might makes right? The reason it isn't is because empirically, we can demonstrate that the law has served emancipatory purposes. I do that in one particular chapter in the book where I show that pa the Palestinian Liberation Organization, in the context of third world upheaval, used the law in order to you know, establish the juridical status of Palestinians as a political community and a political nation with the right to self-determination, used the law in order to condemn Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination akin to apartheid, and used the law to legitimate guerrilla warfare and to elevate the role of guerrilla from that of a criminal combatant to that of a legitimate combatant with the right to kill. Um, and who can be targeted. And so that empirical evidence, at, even in the case of Palestine, that, you know, a, um, a stateless people who are facing off with the fourth, uh, excuse me, the 11th largest military power in the world and the only nuclear power in the Middle East, that the primary U.S. ally in the Middle East, and we're able to use the law in that way, should give us pause that this is not just, you know, what Richard Falk says, you know, in his words, a club to bludgeon the weak. Um, and at the same time, we can't appeal to it. It's not going to produce an outcome for us because the law doesn't have a core meaning. The law has to be adjudicated. And that's the role of the lawyer. If the law was what, you know, whatever it says that it is upon, you know, just, you know, first look and first impression, we wouldn't need lawyers. The role of the lawyer is to interpret the law, to advocate for a particular meaning, to apply precedent, to apply analogy, to argue about jurisdiction. And then the role of the judge is to interpret that is to interpret these competing meanings of the law and then to apply it. And then in the application of the law, you're still going to produce yet another meaning. So that should also temper our notion that the law is what it says on its face. And all of this, you know, corresponds to real world, you know, events that we witness and see for folks who aren't experts and practitioners. And then for the experts and practitioners, this corresponds to different schools of thought in IR theory and critical legal theory of how we understand what the meaning of law is, even if it clearly doesn't have the capacity to command the behavior of states, of states or to punish their transgressions. Because if the law is politics, then like all politics, it's an uneven terrain of struggle upon which the powerful have an advantage, but that doesn't mean it's a fate accompli. It just means it's a bad reality, but that's subject to challenge. Exactly, exactly. And some would look at that and say, but it's such a bad reality and it, you know, it reifies an uneven status quo. And, and what you're doing is you're legitimating the logic that inheres in it, which begins with, you know, these sordid colonial imperial origins. It would be much better to just, you know, attack the law. I get that. I'm very sympathetic to that. But I'm also sympathetic to the fact that we live in these realities and like any other uneven realities in economic terms in military balance of power, political balance of power, all of these are structural asymmetries that completely exclude us. And so I think that unless there is an alternative, there is actually a site to, to challenge all of this at the same time, then it, it's not fair to tell people who are struggling for freedom, who are struggling to make their lives better, to then attack tools that may be available to them that are subject to some sort of contest. The law does not provide a particular answer. It only promises a battle and, a, and it promises that there's going to be a contest over an answer. And so how well we can engage in that contest is, is what's to be determined. And it's one of the reasons I don't focus a lot on the content of law throughout the book, but I'm focusing on the balance, on the contest itself and on uh, the context, historical context uh, across these five junctures I, I chronicle. Let's dive into the history you write that Zionist settler colonialism has, since its inception, created exceptions to the law and then used the law to legitimate those exceptions. The first and foundational exception was under the mandate system that was established by World War I's victors. 
the 1922 British Mandate for Palestine, drawing on the 1917 Balfour Declaration, made creating a Jewish national home in Palestine the central purpose of Britain's mandatory tutelage over the area and referred to Palestinians as simply, quote, existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Explain the mandate period and how Palestine was made into an international legal exception to the League of Nations norm. So let me start because there's two things going on in that question, and obviously that are happy that that I'm also trying to do in the book, which is both to pa- to balance, you know, what I'm saying about legal theory and sovereign exception, and then what I'm saying about the historical moment. So a quick word on sovereign exception. This is a field that's been written about, studied, scrutinized. It's what it's theorized by Carl Schmitt, the response, the, you know, the the greatest response or the most cited response um, academically we get to it is Giorgio Agamben and thinking is the exception where the sovereign declares that some imperative makes necessary the suspension of the application of law in order to achieve a political objective. The question is, is that exception a site of lawfulness? Is it a site of lawlessness? Is it what some would argue, is it a place that's actually exceptional? Is it indeed exceptional, which would mean that it's just temporary? Or is it permanent? as would be the case of, you know, just it becomes a form of governance. And so the first thing that I do in entering that terrain is to offer that I do believe that the sovereign exception is actually, it is a form of governance, and it is a form of governance where this is where the powerful have the greatest advantage in using the law, because the weak can't declare the exception, but the strong can. In declaring it, they're not just saying that now whatever they do is legal, to the contrary, what I argue is that they are using something in law that we uh, that's known as sui generis, unlike anything other, which basically says that because the fact pattern in this situation is so unique that there can be no precedent and there can be no analogy, thereby giving rise to the need for the sovereign to create new law where no adequate law exists. A and new so- situation it requires new law. The situation requires new law, but it's not, you know, it's not because any, any powerful, you know, party can just do what they want. Right. But the fact that that's not what they're doing, they're saying that the fact pattern is unique. Therefore, we must create new law because we don't have existing law that we can apply in this case. So there, there is an appeal to the law's logic and, you know, the law's legitimating function in this instance. And so in creating that new law, That is where the exception is enshrined and how it becomes a form of governance that is, in fact, not temporary, but does have a permanent feature. So, you know, in the outcome of it, the fact pattern and the new law are co-constitutive. You need the new law in order to justify that this reflects a a, a new set of facts and you need the new set of facts in order to justify that you need the new law. And so this became, this, you know, this now has its own internal logic that colonial powers are appealing to. It's not just a matter of colonial hubris, right? They're actually appealing to a new legal logic that is outside of, of any form of con- uh, context, which is why the law can be so oppressive, because for, for marginalized communities, they want to argue, but this is what the law says on our behalf. And yet here you have, you know, really powerful parties that are saying, yeah, but don't look at the context. We just have to look at what the law is saying. And what the law is saying is this site of exception as a, a permanent form of governance. Okay, enough on the 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 high <laughs> kind of <the> lofty <laughs> approach let's bring it down to earth how does this apply in the question of palestine and in the mandate i start in the mandate because in most accounts on the question of palestine in the worst accounts we start in 1967 which is basically to start from the moment of military occupation, but that works to basically normalize Israel's establishment in 1948. And then in other accounts, we start in 1948, which is much better because then at least we're incorporating Israel's establishment, the removal of indigenous peoples and and, and the treatment of the native Palestinians who never fled. I start in 1917 
because what's happening in Israel, even to the present day, is, is a reflection of a colonial legacy that begins with the British mandate. You know, in terms of land tenure, you can even stretch back to look at, at Ottoman, at the Ottoman Empire and, and Ottoman regulation of land. I start in 1917 to basically highlight this exception. So in the Balfour Declaration, Lord Balfour basically promises uh, Palestine as a site of Jewish settlement for a global Jewish population, never promises um, a Jewish state, but does promise a Jewish national home. And the idea was that this would be a cultural and international Mecca, because for the British, what's important at this point is not necessarily, you know, an answer to the Jewish question either. They're not that concerned uh, with the Jewish question, but they are concerned with ongoing penetration into the Middle East and, and domination. And the promising of a Palestinian national home would basically append that desire because it would basically mean independence for the Palestinians and the British can no longer no longer be there. And they don't promise Jewish independence either or Jewish national independence. They're just going to promise a Jewish national home, which means that the British will be able to intervene in order to protect the minority population and justify their presence. It'll extend the clock on their presence and give them a pretext to keep an eye on, say, the flow of oil through the region? No, oh, you know, something simple like that. Minor consideration, <laughs> minor considerations for colonial powers. Yes, absolutely. Um, and they were very concerned about uh, French presence um, in the Middle East and where they, you know, they had established their mandate in Lebanon um, and, and Syria. And so they were they were concerned about their ongoing presence and, and, and how they were going to compete with them. Now, the problem is, is that how are they going to promise uh, Palestine as a site of Jewish settlement when when these territories have been declared as provisionally independent by the League of Nations um, after the f uh, First World War? Um, and these are the vanquished territories of the Ottoman Empire. And, and they're declared, you know, Area A, which means they're provisionally independent. They just need a bit of tutelage in order to be able to stand on their feet and become independent. And so here's where we we here's where it gets complicated and where legal argumentation comes into play. On the one hand, the British are making an argument that Palestine was accepted from this arrangement. And there is an entire exchange of letters. This is um, the McMahon Hassan correspondence about whether or not Palestine was actually um, exempted from the promise of independence. Um, and then there's the other issue, which is that what the League of Nations Charter says about you, you must consult the local population to understand who they prefer for, you know, to be the mandatory power. You must consult the local population about what they actually desire. And then there's the other issue, which is in, and, and this is the exceptional part, where the Brit where Lord Balfour is basically defining 90% of the native population in, in the negative, that they are non-Jewish. So it's not that they don't know that Palestinians are there. They clearly know that they're there. They just don't think that they matter and they shouldn't matter. And the reason that they, and it's, you know, in Lord Balfour's own words, it's, you know, Zionism, be it right or wrong, is far more noble than the whims of some 700,000 Arabs. You know, the, the logic for it. So here's the unique fact pattern, right? So here's where the unique fact pattern and the, and the exceptional framework are going to be co-constitutive. The unique fact pattern is that this Palestine, unlike the other um, Area A territories, is of, uh, of great significance to the three monotheistic religions and not just to the, the native population that lives there, number one. Number two, the, the cause of establishing a Jewish national home is so noble that we can't look away. And number three... Frankly, it's just a racist argument that this is a population that's expendable and anyway um, is not fit to govern itself. So th those three things become the unique fact pattern that then give rise to what the British themselves and later the League of Nations describes as a sui generis mandate. They literally say Palestine 
is unlike in the inner war years. This is be- right that Palestine is unlike any other area a mandate, and therefore it will not be subject to the same law that would apply to the other area a mandates. And that logic becomes co-constitutive: the fact pattern and the logic, which makes all Palestinian appeals to the law in order to insist on their national independence fall flat. Even this particular exception, though, around Palestine is also sort of an extreme case of the of, of the general issue of this huge discrepancy in how the concept of self-determination after World War I, in terms of mm. how it's read by colonizers on the one mm. hand and the colonized on the other. You know, I'll be really honest. Even for me, this was a learning journey um, to, to as I was, you know, for I had taken for granted that self-determination had a particular meaning because I understand what it means today. And it um, sounds like what it means on it what it, what it means and, and, you know, what it's meant historically. So to then have even this notion become really complicated. So um, thanks to Shirin Say Ali, who points me to the work of Timothy Mitchell and others, um, and Adam Gatachu does this incredibly well in her uh, book, uh, Work, World Making the Rise and Fall of Self-Determination, which unfortunately I did not read until after I was finished with my own book. But self-determination, like all law, is has a contested meaning. And in the aftermath of the First World War, as it's presented, it's not equivalent to national self-determination. It's for the colonizers, right? For the imperial powers, it is justifying their ongoing presence. It basically, you know, assumes that native populations will be able to, able to govern themselves when they most closely mirror European and colonial powers. And so you are at the outset enshrining European, uh, a European model of sovereignty that all other colonized peoples must aspire to. But in order to aspire to it and in order to, to achieve it, they have to model this European structure, which then justifies the presence of these colonial powers in these territories in the framework of a benevolent occupier, a benevolent colonizer that's basically uh, training them to stand on their feet. So here you have self-determination, which becomes a tool to uh, to legitimate the ongoing penetration of these colonial powers. So that's that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, we attribute this to you know the Fort uh, Woodrow Wilson's fourteen points about you know nations that are able to govern themselves, but that also was not really ever the objective. Even it in would have been Le- news to him, <laughs> right? Even in the League of Nations mandate, um, in the in the in the charter system, excuse me, that designates you know the t- three tiers of the former German and Ottoman territories, Area C, which are the African territories, are never going to be eligible for independence. They're just, whereas areas A, which are the, the Ottoman territories, are marked as provisionally independent and are marked as, as, you know, one day they will be able to govern themselves. The African territories are never even eligible. I mean, it was, it was a very, it's a, it's a racist structure as well. And so it takes outright revolt in the inner war years and through what becomes the third world revolt culminating in the 1960 uh, UN declaration 1514 that basically condemns colonialism as an illegitimate form of governance. That's when self-determination then takes on new meaning. And it takes on new meaning um, that's tantamount, that basically makes it tantamount to national independence. And this also evidences how law can change over time based on the context and based on, you know, that, that, and the contest, that political contest that's taking place. Well, another important piece of context involves that, that revolt, which Palestinians were a part of from very Mm -hmm. early on, from 1936 to 1939, Palestinians launched what was called the Great Revolt against Zionist settlement as British colonial policy, which I think is extremely important context. And and Palestinians won a huge victory. Britain's 1939 White Paper, which called for a policy reversal on Jewish settlement. You write, quote, Palestinians forced Britain to reevaluate its Zionist policy not by the use of moral and legal persuasion, but by changing the material conditions on the ground. Mm. 
they effectively challenged their exclusion from the promise of self-determination and the negation of their status as a political community by undermining the structure that upheld the framework of exception. Explain your analysis here and why that victory didn't hold. The book as it is now, and anybody who writes a book, or frankly, anybody who writes, knows that it's a completely iterative process. What you put down on paper the first, second, third time is right. not what you eventually put out in the universe. And so, you know, my original, my original introduction began with the Hsin McMahon correspondence and the le- what I was talking about earlier, this exchange of letters between Sir Henry McMahon and Sharif Hsin, where Sharif Hsin promises to ally with the British in, in the First World War against the Ottomans on condition that in the case of victory, that the, the former Ottoman territories will be able to become independent, right? McMahon writes, yes, of course, of, will, that, will, that will happen with the exception of a particular territory. And that's what becomes the object of the legal debate. And in, in the original, in my original introduction, I detail that legal debate, you know, what, you know, what was actually exempt, what were the territories, what maps were they looking at? And then I stop short and say, none of it mattered. None of that legal argumentation mattered. What mattered was what happened in the Great Revolt between 1936 to 1939 when Palestinians forced the British to deploy 25,000 troops on the ground, when the Palestinians actually militarily took over Jerusalem for eight hours, when it took it, it required the British to actually squash it so forcefully that by the end of the Great Revolt, they had decimated 10% of the adult male population who was either exiled, imprisoned, or murdered by the end of this. Um, and so, and and what happens, not only, and I'm going to get to the white paper and how it changed policy, but in the course of that, they actually unearth the Sin McMahon correspondence. So whereas they, they refused where they refused to revisit the legal argumentation that Palestinians were making that we were never exempt from the promise of independence in the course of revolt, the British Colonial Office and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I forget the exact name, where they are actually unearthing this debate. And whereas before they said unequivocally Palestine was excluded for independence, in the course of the Great Revolt, they say, well, we can't say it was unequivocally excluded, but maybe it could be excluded. But Palestinians can also make the argument that it wasn't. So even on just the level of legal interpretation and legal debate, the legal debate, the grounds for legal debate change. And even the legal interpretation changes. So it's not just, you know, a question of, of foreign policy considerations. Like these, this is, this also, there, there's a feedback loop um, that's happening. So in the course of the Great Revolt, Palestinians basi- basically uh, first go on strike, then they declare a tax revolt, then there's an armed uprising. It lasts for three years. It is, it's overwhelming and it reflects a grassroots uprising amongst Palestinians themselves because as today we have a schism between a Palestinian grassroots and a Palestinian official leadership in the interwar years, there was also a Palestinian elite leadership in the form of the Arab High, High Committee and the Palestinian grassroots. And it was the grassroots that, that revolted, that rejected this idea of appealing to the British in order to prove their eligibility for independence and self-determination and decide we're just going to have to displace them altogether in order to end Zionist policy. And so that's the aftermath. They get the white paper. They get the document that said where the British say we were wrong. It was wrong to basically declare this as, you know, a site of unfettered Jewish settlement and and land sales. And we have to regulate this. Uh, They don't promise um, Palestinian independence either. But they say and they, by the way, never necessarily describe it as Palestinian. They describe it as Arab. But they do say that they will subject it to a referendum that at least now there is eligibility for Palestinian independence. The white paper never comes to fruition for a whole host of of reasons, not least of which is Palestinian internal short-sightedness that's well-documented by um, historian Porath as well as Rashid Khalidi. But ultimately, the biggest, biggest reason that it never gets implemented or, or seen through is because of the Second World War. <laughs> 
And this is in 1939 when it's issued. The Second World War is on the horizon. Um, by the time the Second World War is over, Churchill is now in power. The balance of power has, has, has drastically changed. And now there's an other imperative of for the United Nations, the now created United Nations, to respond to uh, the crisis of Jewish refugees. Which a lot of the West is responding to. I just have been reviewing this history for my own book by not letting Jewish refugees in. The U.S. systematically, everything it could at multiple levels to keep Jewish ref- displaced persons out. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, one of the things about how this is framed for, and, and I think that the, the discussion is most, you know, reductionist and, and unhelpful in the United States because of our role in this story. We're not a third party. We are part of we are part of the problem. Um, And so here we have the most unhelpful approach to this question. The British, the US, and European powers that basically lobby and advocate for the establishment of a Jewish national home and a a state um, in the aftermath of the Second World War are not just driven because of empathy for the refugee quest, Jewish refugee question. At this point, they don't, it's an anti-Semitic motive. It's an anti-Jewish bigotry. They don't want them in their country. They don't want to have to resolve the, you know, the, a Jewish question and the exclusion of Jews from a European polity, which enshrined, you know, a, a particular form of white European Christian supremacy that has excluded Jews first on religious grounds and then within an Enlightenment framework. And so much of the drive to establish a Jewish state is also a drive to not have to absorb Jewish refugees. I mean, this is really problematic, but it also means that this is unfinished business. And perversely, the Jewish agency is complicit in this effort to bar Jewish refugees from from entry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's part at, at this point there is the drive well, you, let's use this to our advantage in order to establish a Jewish state. And and we can, you know, we we should be really cynical about that. But the point is here that what the Jewish agency is doing at this point makes sense in light of the fact that what political Zionism had decided, which is that it would not combat this framework of white supremacy. It would internalize it. It had accepted that there would be no way for Jews to live a dignified, full life within European society if they did not establish a state outside of its shores. Uh, So that then they can be accepted, they can be a part of Europe, but only when they weren't in Europe and then, you know, triggering these anxieties. So you're, you're maintaining a white supremacist framework intact and assuming that now you'll be you'll be able to be a member of 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 this club, of this European nation, which is a white nation, a white suprem- uh, based on you know a white supremacist sense of self, by by not being part of its polity at all. That white supremacist framework becomes a state, the state of Israel, in 1948, when Zionist troops systematically expelled Palestinians from their home, and declared a Jewish state comprising, I think it's 78 percent of mandate territory. How did Zionists deploy violence in such a way as to reduce the Palestinian population within that territory by nearly 90 percent within a year of the state of Israel's creation? How did this mass violence targeting civilians to ensure a, quote, decisive Jewish demographic majority, how did that become legalized in retrospect? In other words, as you write, how was it that, quote, the state's establishment retroactively legitimated Israel's founding violence. Okay, Daniel, you know you've got me. You've got three questions in there, right? I know. So, I know. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me try I'm to break tricky. this down real quick because you're giving your listeners something about why is it significant that Israel is now established in seventy eight percent of the mandate. That's really significant, and that's going to come up again because when the UN partitions. Uh, Palestine. And Palestinians have always been against partition. They do not want to split the baby. They want to keep the baby. They're the majority. Let Jews remain as a protected minority who can then, you know, immigrate as Palestinian citizens, right? And so they're against partition. And that's what Resolution 181 did in November 1947, which basically, you know, established that 55 percent of the mandate would be become the Jewish uh, state and 45% would become the Arab state. 
Arabs don't reject this. They get the least fertile ground. They're getting the le- they're getting 45%, even though they're the unequivocal majority at this point. It's a 70-30 split, 70% Palestinian, 30% Jewish. So and they don't want to partition the land. So there's a rejection of partition. And this is really key because Zionists use the Palestinian rejection of partition as basically their surrender of what 181 promises will be an Arab state. So Zionists then argue, well, Palestinians rejected partition and went to war. Therefore, they can't appeal to 181 to say that they have any legitimacy to establish a state or have a right to self-determination. This becomes really key. And 181 is also is what establishes Jerusalem as a corpus separatum that says it won't come under any national jurisdiction in any eventual state. It will become an internationally regulated um, site. And and Zionists don't want that either because they want to bring it under Jewish sovereignty. And so we'll see that they also use legal argumentation about how they do that. So that's one. So the fact that when Israel establishes itself on 78% of the territory, notice that they, they've basically exceeded the boundaries that have been allotted by Resolution 181, even though Israel bases its legal legitimacy on that very resolution. So that that's going to be key. The second question you ask is about, well, how do they do it? How do they recalibrate the demographic balance if it's 70% Palestinians and 30% Jews? And this is subject to an intense amount of historical debate and historiography. We have been told for years by Zionists, and this is before the Israeli military archives become public, that the Arab leaders told told the Palestinians to flee so that they can destroy Israel. So that's why they leave. And then that's why they're never allowed to come home. So, you know, this is, this is the subject of the greatest amount of historiography. Once the archives become public, we have Israeli historians, the new historians, telling us actually there were never those, that was not actually what happened. What, you know, there's an other story to be told about the, the, the Palestinian refugee population. The best that we get in these historical, you know, accounts, the, even the revised ones, is that, okay, fine, Defin didn't tell the Palestinians to flee, but also we can't agree that Israel ethnically cleansed Palestine because there isn't an actual order to ethnically cleanse. There's nothing in the archives that, that uh, you know, with few exceptions, where, you know, Ben-Gurion tells Israeli armed forces, force them out, remove them. And because of the lack of that evidence, you can't say that this what, there was intent to remove. This is where I add, you know, something that'll come up in in Israel's contemporary wars, especially in the Gaza Strip that we've been seeing vividly, but the seed of what they call defensive force. Israel is has defined or Zionists have defined that in order to be a state, in order to fulfill Zionist ambitions of establishing a Jewish state, it must be an 80% majority Jewish. And that's a demographic balance that they can't achieve where it's a 70-30 split. And so, and they also know that even the powers that support them, the UN, the US, the UK, do not want to use force in order to establish partition because it'll be counterproductive. And so Zionist forces basically take it upon themselves to complete this radical population redistribution, so to speak, in, in, in very cleansed terms, and the land distribution, where they're going to now have control over 78% of the territory. And they do it under a framework of defensive force, which basically defines the presence of Palestinians as a threat and define as a threat because they can actually house Palestinian fighters. And so now this legitimates why they can bomb Palestinian villages into rubble, because doing that will then eliminate a a place for the Palestinian guerrillas to take shelter. And it basically justifies under that same framework, Palestinian removal beyond their borders in order for Zionist forces to be able to to take to have a military advantage 
over hilltops or certain positions where they want to establish military military corridors. So this is where we see Zionist forces both securitize Palestinians and use the framework of defensive force even when they're aggressively attacking Palestinians, targeting them, using collective punishment in order to achieve their military advantage, and how they can come out the other end and say, well, we never had a military order to remove. They just happened to flee. It was the outcome of this kind of, you know, these military operations between November 19 or December 1947, I should say, and March 1949, when the armistice agreements between Israel and, and the belligerent Arab states are established, that we see 80% of the native po Palestinian population removed from what becomes Israel. And then the last question you asked yeah. is how did they legitimate this use of force? And this is about theories of force, of what's legitimate and illegitimate. And here, you know, I'm drawing on different theorists of basically how state force can become legitimate and revolutionary force can become legitimate in the aftermath as it becomes enshrined in the state itself. Once Israel becomes a state, you know, declares its independence and is accepted by the UN as a member state, by the way, not at its first application because of these controversies, but once it's accepted as a, as a state, it now has the protection of the UN Charter which it protects its territorial integrity as well as promises against um, any form of external intervention so that the force that it uses now becomes beyond reproach. It's too late. You can't. It's now embodied in the state itself. Um, and what was what could have been violent and genocidal and a different had had the outcome been different different is now recast as revolutionary force necessary to establish Israel's independence. They're imbued with state sovereignty and the state's legitimate use of violence retroactively. Exactly. It's, it's so bizarre that Israel's defenders argue over whether the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians was intentional or not, or whether who and what level of the chain of command gave what order, given that Israel immediately made it clear that they found this ethnic cleansing to be extremely desirable. The state quickly created a set of laws to privilege Jewish, Jewish presence, dispossess remaining Palestinians of their land, and prevent the return of Palestinian refugees, including by killing an estimated three to 5,000 of them who tried to return. And then they tried, and then they deported those who made it through anyways. How in these earlier years did Israel use a combination of law and violence to to reorder racialized demographics and remake ties to the land? That's a great question. You know, I think it's, you know, as somebody, again, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a student approaching this, um, you know, even as somebody who's been studying and, you know, as a practitioner, I learned so much even to go back and unearth that it is a nuanced debate about whether or not it was ethnic cleansing. That was news to me that we, you know, that it's much more sensitive and it has to do with, you know, the, you know what's available in the archives. But the other issue about just the debate, you know, that this ongoing question of did Israel force the Palestinians to flee or did was this something that they did voluntarily, right? This becomes for a Decades, for decades, the reason that we can't even discuss the right of return for Palestinian refugees in unequivocal terms and why it becomes politicized from its outset and enshrined in UN General Assembly Resolution 194 and why there's even a different UN agency, uh, UN, United Nations Relief Works Agency that precedes the establishment of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in 1951. And we even have these different legal regimes. All of that, you know, it's giving rise to all of this debate. But as you point out, let's assume we don't know what the real story is. At the end of the day, look what Israel does immediately in its first acts of government. It immediately works to take 
British emergency law that it established during the Great Revolt in order to squash the Palestinian rebellion, it immediately adopts them with few exceptions so that they can apply them to the remaining Palestinians as a racialized form of government, the minority that remains, and so that they can continue to confiscate their lands, control their movement, uh, place them under surveillance, and them specifically, they immediately as you point out, pass new laws that establish a law of return for Jews anywhere in the world while simultaneously negating the right to return of uh, Palestinian refugees. And they're using what some would describe in humanitarian law as disproportionate force, what others would just describe as lethal force or frontier eliminatory violence against the Palestinians who are returning by foot across the borders in order to be with their family. They're declaring those who do, they're they're creating a criminal status for those who do return as infiltrators. And so that criminality then can extend to the... They become illegalized immigrants, essentially. And and not just that, but let's say somebody came back, a, a daughter separated from her family, returns on foot to be with her family. Because she's illegal, she's now an infiltrator with a criminal status, The family that she's returned to live with is now also committing a crime by letting her stay with them, by harboring her. And so it becomes a justification for collective punishment against them. All of these things work together, and and Zionists and Israeli leaders are really obvious, are really explicit and honest about what they're doing. Shira Robinson, in her book *Citizen Strangers*, documents this beautifully and 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 you know meticulously that the the military commission basically you know studies the emergency laws that are applied against the Palestinian native population who are now a minority within the new Israeli state and set, you know, determines that they are not a security threat. And yet Ben-Gurion responds, our establishment of a martial order and, and the application of these emergency laws is in order to facilitate Jewish settlement, ongoing Jewish settlement within the Israeli state in order to confiscate Uh, the lands of even the Palestinian natives to confiscate the lands of the Palestinian refugees who are not able to return to assert that these are their lands and even to to be compensated, let alone um, combat, in order to be able to to establish new Jewish settlements. They established something like 350 settlements in, in in Israel. Um, on Palestinian lands in order to negate that they Which they, were they treat as like abandoned property. Right. And the abandoned property. I mean, this now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of Israel's own laws of what they declare as abandoned property. And really interesting, it's abandoned if nobody claims it, except those who can claim it are prohibited from claiming it because they can't return because they're Palestinian refugees. Oh, and so therefore it's ours. Nobody claimed it. I mean, this is... The kind of not you're saying what's the relationship between law and violence, but here we're seeing legal violence. This is legal violence um, being perpetrated, and it's one of those things that should you know that's really germane, especially um, in thinking about you know how it a lot of people will say, well, Palestinian Israelis can participate in the Israeli elections and be members of the Knesset and possibly now be you know the opposition party, and and what they take for granted is that. This exceptional governance that racialized Palestinians as other, as a fifth column and as a security threat that was established in 1948 and is basically applied as martial law through 1966 becomes internalized into Israel's civil law so that Israel now can allow Palestinians to participate in political life and still exclude them as a mod- matter of law and institutionally subject them to you know, a racialized exclusion and subjugation because of these seeds um, that are planted between 1948 and 1966, which have forever placed Palestinians outside of the law. And so insofar as they're included within it, they're included within it in order to be excluded in the language of law. And there was all this outrage recently over Netanyahu's new nationality law, but this is privileging Jewish nationality is is, is far from new. It's foundational. As, as the husband of a Jewish woman, I'm not Jewish myself, I still have a legal right to Israeli citizenship, if I read your work correctly, that is denied 
to Palestinians driven from their home by armed terror. It's hard to think of a clearer example of the fundamental racism underpinning Zionist ideology as expressed through law that's just core to the state of Israel. You know, so, you know, you say it like that, and, and for so many people who understand this or have visited, it seems, you know, so commonsensical. What is the problem? It's so obvious. And yet why this becomes so controversial is precisely because of the way that Zionists have framed the story of being Jews as native to this land. And so what they're doing is not colonization. They can't colonize what's theirs. They, you know, they're redeeming the land and liberating it from these Arabs who are actually not from there and can go everywhere else. And so for, you know, for us looking, you know, at the nation state law passed in July 2018, it's basically an explicit declaration that Israel is a Jewish state and it makes it a constitutional obligation to settle all of these lands in the West Bank with throughout Israel, that the only people who are entitled to self-determination are Jews, notwithstanding the Palestinians who are, you know, citizens who are 20% of Israeli population, notwithstanding, obviously, the nearly 5 million Palestinians who live in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip who are denied their sovereignty on the one hand and excluded from any kind of voting rights on the other, you know. And notwithstanding the diaspora, Either as well. The diaspora of where, you know, two thirds of the Palestinian population lives, you know, anybody. So here you have this very explicit law where Israel is saying, we are racist. We are going to, you know, make this a Jewish only state. That's going to be a constitutional norm of ours. This is what we want. That's where Richard Spencer can look at the, you know, respond to the nation state law and say, you know, Israel is now providing a model of European sovereignty. This is what all European and Western states should do, which is basically declare themselves uh, a state for white people. That's all we want to do anyway here in the United States. What's wrong with that? Right. And so you can look at that and all of our logic that would, you know, this universal logic that can declare it white supremacy in the U.S., that can declare its mixed admixture with military force as fascism in places now in the U.S. and in other places like India, where Hindu nationalism and, and militarism is certainly at a rise, or in Brazil. But we get to Israel's doorstep, and that, you know, that logic just falls. That logic just falls, and here we see this exceptional argumentation emerge once again to create a unique, you know, set of facts where otherwise applicable law is no longer relevant. In the 1967 war, Israel then goes on, of course, to seize the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, and also the Egyptian Sinai and Syria's Golan Heights. But Israel declared the Palestinian territories it seized as somehow outside the bounds of occupation law, a law that was, in part, if I remember correctly, a response to Nazi expansionism during World War II, the, the delegitimation of the right to territorial expansion through conquest. How did Israel manage to treat its conquest of the West Bank and Gaza as something other than an occupation? And how did that, in turn, facilitate the consolidation of a new settler colonial frontier? 1967. So again, a little bit of insight into my own um, journey. I first heard about, you know, the argument that the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, are not occupied, but are disputed territories. I first heard that as a first year law student at UC Berkeley. And of course, you know, it was in a student debate that we set up with Zionist students. And, and we were about a total of, of three Arab students in the entire student body. But anyway, we, <laughs> we, we set up this debate. And this was the first time I heard that argument. And I thought to myself, they made that up. This is just, this is some, this is some bullshit, right? It must be. Um, <laughs> because it sounds so absurd. Because it sounds question. so absurd. Um, and then I come, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm working with my favorite professor on independent research, who is, you know, the, the son of Holocaust survivors and somebody who's very empathetic and, and, it, you know, wants, 
wants to see me succeed and is mentoring me as a professor, Professor Richard Buxbaum. And as I'm writing my paper, and I'm, I'm basically writing a paper about the application of basically trying to, to explore how we can sue Israeli generals for their incursion into Janine in 2002 for violations of occupation law that are tantamount to war crimes. And Professor Buxbaum says to me, well, how do, how do you know that occupation law applies? And I'm looking, you know, I'm thinking, well, the student is crazy. That's why he said that crazy argument about disputed. But Professor Buxbaum is the real deal. If he's telling me this, I got to, you know, I have to look into this. And so this is where I discover Israel's argumentation about disputed territories, which is basically to say that because the West Bank and Gaza did not have a rightful sovereign at the time of war in 1967, that you cannot apply occupation law to it because occupation law is a, a legitimate regime, that legal regime that's meant to transfer, to transition from a, uh, a status of wartime to revert to peacetime and to revert to the status quo ante. And in which case you hold on to the territory until the end of, uh, until you've established peace and then you, you revert that territory towards its rightful owners. And Israel is arguing that, you know, Jordan was not the sovereign of the West Bank, even though they annexed it. Nobody recognized their sovereignty except for the British and, and Pakistan, and so no one's going to recognize that. Egypt never claimed sovereignty um, over Gaza, but was always just a trustee of it. And Palestinians don't exist, and they don't even bother to tell you that Palestinians in this argument, this missing reversion or argument that's uh, forwarded by Yehuda V. Blum, who was a law professor at Hebrew University at the time, he doesn't even bother to tell you that Palestinians don't exist. It's just not even an argument. That's just assumed. It's just presumed. They don't even they don't even feature. There's no such thing as a Palestinian. There's some motley crew of Arab refugees who who ended up there and who hate Israel, and that's why they want to be Palestinian because of, they're driven by their hate of Israel. It's such a self absorbed argument as it's well. A weird, we, weird thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can talk weird. about that. Um, but anyway, um, and so therefore, there's no occupation because there's no sovereign. But Israel is also mindful of, this is 1967, right? The Resolution 1514 condemning colonialism is passed in 1960. Algeria has achieved its independence in 1962. This is, you know, we're basically approaching the height, the apex of, of anti-colonial revolution and national liberation warfares. Israel can't say that they can't just take territory that doesn't belong to them. It would be com it would be immediately condemned by the international community. And at the same time, because they do do that in Jerusalem, they totally take Jerusalem in, in the light of day, right, against all international opposition. They don't do that with the rest of the West Bank and with the Gaza Strip because if they take the territory, if they annex it, they're going to have to take all the Palestinians that live on that land which will disrupt their Jewish majority, demographic majority that they were so excited to have established in the course of the 1948 war. And so now they come up with a really, you know, what some would say is a very ingenious legal argument, which is, okay, fine. It's not occupied, but it's not not occupied, right? It's something that, again, they're advancing sui generis. It's unlike anything else. And so we're going to have to determine as the benevolent occupier what that looks like. And what they decide is that because they're not an occupying power by law, they do not have to apply occupation law as a matter of law, but instead will apply occupation law as a matter of fact. And so that will give the Israeli military establishment and the Israeli uh, Supreme Court, its judiciary or its high court, the ability to pick and choose which provisions of occupation law to apply. What they do with this is a few things. One is this legitimates their presence in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So now they're there legally under the framework of occupation, but they are not bound by the strict application of occupation law, which includes the outright prohibition of the acquisition of territory by force and the outright 
prohibition on the settlement of civilians of an occupying power into the territory that it occupies because they're saying that they don't have to adhere to all of occupation law. They'll just adhere to the to the parts that it that it thinks are necessary. And what it deems are necessary are the humanitarian provisions of occupation law, but none of its political guarantees that would guarantee the maintenance of the demographic, legal, and economic status quo or political status quo in place at the time of occupation. So Israel is getting the best of all worlds where it's legal, it looks like it's complying, but it's not adhering to the prohibition on on civilian settlement. It's taking Palestinian lands while incrementally removing the Palestinians that are on them under the framework of military exigency, again, military necessity or defensive force, and the only way that they're able to then, you know, it's it's not enough. It's not enough for Israel to have a good legal argument. It's the fact that they're allied with the United States who, because of their own global, you know, considerations, and at this time it's the Cold War, they're neck deep in, in Vietnam. They're concerned about being able to, you know, compete against the Soviet Union in the Middle East. And in the aftermath of the 1967 war, Uh, The Lyndon B. Johnson administration switches up its approach to the Middle East, which is to say, we'll no longer be try to establish a stalemate policy. But now we see that Israel can be a key ally. So we'll just provide it with a qualitative military edge so that it can defeat any Arab force that attacks it alone or all of them at the same time. And that's been policy since. And that's been our policy since. So that's been our policy since. And then that together with the drafting history of UN Security Council Resolution 242 and the dropping of the definite article that describes occupied territory, these three pieces together then create what I describe as the legal machinery that has allowed Israel to steadily take Palestinian land without Palestinians, without the people, under a legal framework where it has been able to then also evade any kind of international accountability, not despite occupation law, but specifically because of occupation law and the logic it offers. Well, let me pause you there, because just briefly, you just referred to a definite article being dropped. The legal fight over 242 hinged on the exclusion of the definite article, the. Just briefly, how did that definite article absence come to, quote, justify its settler, Israel's settler colonial expansion into the West Bank and Gaza. So there's a whole drafting history um, of of the drafting of Resolution 242. So immediate, this is in June 1967. I think the Security Council is already in session. And so this immediately goes to the Security Council. They arrive at a stalemate. It then goes to the, a, an emergency session in the General Assembly. They can't resolve it. It comes back to the Security Council. And most of the debate is revolving around the question of whether or not Israel has to withdraw from the Sinai, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip immediately, or if it could stay there and then keep the territories and return them in exchange for permanent peace. The United States is unequivocally on Israel's side and wants to ensure that it can stay in the territories and not have to withdraw the UK is supporting Israel, but is also concerned about the Arabs and doesn't just, you know, is trying, you know, ultimately it's it's um, the British representative, uh, Calderon, I think his name is, who then negotiates the final draft of 242. And then you have the non-aligned bloc that is arguing Israel can't keep these territories. The 1967 war was aggressive force. It was not defensive force. They attacked Egypt first without um, Egyptian, you know, an Egyptian strike. And so therefore they just have to give the territory back. And so there's fierce debate over this. And and that's why it takes so long. The balance that they come to in this final formulation is one where they basically agree that Israel will give the territory back once there is permanent peace established and something that no that you know that, that that all the parties took for granted except for with few exception including Syria is that they were going to drop the definite article from you know they weren't going to say all the territories or the territories occupied it would just say 
territories occupied in the recent conflict because the Johnson administration was keen that Israel be able to renegotiate the final borders because the armistice lines that were established in 1949 had proved tenuous, that these couldn't be the permanent borders, that they needed better borders. But the idea was always that those, that th those negotiations would just yield slight modification. In Israel's formulation, they didn't want a resolution. They weren't planning on giving the territory back. We see this in the work of um, Israeli historians Gorenberg and Avi Raz. They, they had every intention of staying in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, and, and of driving a Mack Mac truck through that legal loophole. And, and, but they used this legal loophole, um, and immediately, Im even, in, even in, during the vote, as they're voting in November 1967, as all of the different states are saying, even though we're not including the definite article, this is what we mean. We mean all the territories. This is what we intend it to mean. This is what you know the intention is. When um, the Israeli representative stands up to speak, he says, the resolution says what it says and does not say what it does not mean to say. <laughs> it intends Orwellian. from the beginning that the that the exclusion of the definite article would mean that you know we have to withdraw from territory but it doesn't this law doesn't explain which territory and that's when we see different legal arguments emerge one argument is that well if we give the Sinai back and the Sinai is multiple times the size of the West Bank in Gaza then we fulfilled the terms of 242 and other argument that's the one that we see now incorporated into the contemporary peace process is one that says, well, as long as they're defensible borders, but Israel gets to define what the defensible borders are. And, and those defensible borders that were articulated in 1967 by an Israeli labor government included what we see now being saying is defensible borders, which is the Jordan Valley. So much of, of what we're seeing now right, is basically the culmination of a steady strategic approach uh, that Israel has pursued systematically under the framework, you know, using legal argumentation, using force, and, and, and obviously uh, using its relationship to the United States. And perhaps the only thing that's, that's more perverse in this legal work that Israel was doing to legitimate their control over the West Bank and Gaza was just more fundamentally how the 67 war, you write, quote, obscured and helped further normalize the conquest of 48 that this happened in in many ways including through resolution 242 which called for the withdrawal from seized territory but referred to palestinians only as as the quote refugee problem how did this round of israeli aggression and and domination once again serve to normalize past acts of aggression and domination Right. So this is connected again to the, the, the question you asked about retroact, uh, retroactively legitimizing the use of force as we see in the aftermath of the 1948 war, this violence that you know produces a, a massive Palestinian refugee population. Again, it's the aftermath. This is so crucial. This is so crucial. This is the turning point, and 242 is the turning point that really sets us on a different historical and diplomatic, you know, frame of how we understand the Palestinian struggle for freedom because it's this and and we see it today right most people want to if just refer to 1967 we cannot precede that moment we'll just talk about the occupied territories to do more than that would be to negate Israel's right to exist you are being anti-semitic and so much of it you know and this is, is contained even within the seemingly radical phrase and the occupation potentially is just absolutely it, right? even when we say end the occupation you know it's you, you're giving right and, and it's fair to say end the occupation because this is a military occupation even though it's settler colonialism and it's apartheid throughout you know israel and the west bank in gaza it's a military occupation in the West Bank and Gaza because of the, the different uh, legal regime and the, and, and the kind of uh, the way that Palestinians are regulated in those territories. So while it's germane, even when we say that, we're basically, you know, erecting a false partition. We're, 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 we're condemning the occupation, but forgiving settler colonialism. We're condemning the occupation, but upholding apartheid. Um, right. And so 
so much, so much happens here, especially, you know, and even the most well-meaning, even the most well-meaning um, advocates will say, well, we want to, we want to stick to this framework because that's where international consensus lies is on the 242 lines. If you say anything else, now you've gone beyond what the law can offer us in terms of a remedy and you've exceeded international consensus. And, you know, that's another conversation to have about how do you how do you create a consensus and how do you create new political realities? But suffice it to say, this is one of the most significant turning points and a key part of why it becomes what it becomes is because the Arab states are OK with it. The right. Egypt and Jordan are part of the unanimous vote for Resolution 242. They, too enshrine the juridical erasure of Palestinians as there's nothing in the document, there's nothing in 242 that promises that Palestinians will be sovereign. There is something that says that Israel will become, will normalize its relations and become a permanent political entity. There's nothing that says there will be a Palestinian state. There's nothing that unearths 181 and says that 181 has not been fulfilled. A Jewish state was established, but a Palestinian state was never established. And the Arab states sign on to it because they believe that it's the best that they can achieve and because this is a moment of, of significant defeat. This is also the moment when Palestinian militias emerge and take over, basically declare that the Arabs have failed them, that the Arab states have failed them, that they no longer want to Palestinian cause, they no longer want it to be a derivative cause of Arab nationalism. They want to establish it as its own national cause. And it's when Yasser Arafat in 1967 on behalf of Fatah and the different Palestinian military forces take over the PLO and transform it from what is an Arab nationalist you know, body as it's established in 1964, an elitist body, into basically, um, you know, this national liberation group in 1968. You know, that, that begins the era that Palestinians know as a revolutionary era. And so the self-organization, Palestinian self-organization for national liberation is in many ways a response to them being sold out by Arab leaders. That's another way to put it. <laughs> you know, there's there's this thing about the way that we discuss these issues. In so many ways, we 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 create bifurcations between Israel and the rest of the Arab world, and so much right. of that is a reflection of Arab nationalism. And yet, a textured analysis of that history demonstrates that you know, Arab regimes have not necessarily uh, been ever been. Um, Palestinian allies. There, you know, so much of the conflict that Palestinians face are actually within and among and against the Arab regimes themselves. Jordan, obviously, which, you know, is ex they explicitly call out as part of a Hashemite Zionist U.S. triangulation. Egypt, obviously, um, becomes uh, a major source of friction, a Sadat. And, and what is Sadat enters into permanent peace with Israel without securing independence for the Palestinians or even recognition of them. They're, you know, what they're uh, subject to by Syria, even though, you know, the Syrian regime had always, you know, been the greatest um, advocate of the Palestinian cause has also inflicted a, a significant amount of harm against Palestinians and Palestinian refugees. And yet because of... Including through invading, by invading Lebanon. Absolutely. By invading Lebanon um, and and by undercutting what would have, might have been, what might have been an alternative history had, you know, the left, left Lebanese forces and the, Palis, uh, and the PLO prevailed in the civil war. And one of the reasons we have such a hard time talking about it is because we're in, we're, you know, we're, we're in such a pitched battle where there's so much at stake and there's so much ground being ceded that we tend to see nuance as as part as a problem and as a sign of weakness and yet here i say it's everything is bearing out that you know what the regimes are doing today these arab regimes are doing in the sense that you know saudi arabia has has told 
Palestinians that they should accept whatever they get. We see Egypt, Sisi's Egypt, uh, colluding uh, with Israel in order to undermine uh, the ceasefire that Hamas could have negotiated in 2014. We see Egypt also colluding and erecting, you know, and maintaining the the enclosure and the blockade at Rafah at the at the border, the southern border of Gaza. We see the UAE literally trying, you know, declaring, you know, that they're they're in an alliance with Israel and that the newest, the threat to the Middle East is Iran. So all of these things, all of these contemporary things that make people feel like, wow, there's this betrayal, there'd never been loyalty. There'd never been loyalty, which should also, you know, the reason that we should emphasize that is to emphasize, you know, a, a key part of Palestine's future and a key part of of liberation is not going to come from these real politique, you know, pragmatist considerations of which states to align with, but has always been contingent on you, a demonstration of unity, of national movement, of people to people alliances that are never going to be part of the dominant norm, but are always fighting against the grain for what looks like an impossible future. This is Sarah Jaffe, and you are listening to The Dig with Daniel Denver, my favorite podcast for thoughtful discussions on the U.S. left and beyond. And you can support it on Patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at Patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is How to Be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century by Eric Olin Wright, with an afterword by Michael Burroway. Capitalism has transformed the world and increased our productivity, but at the cost of enormous human suffering. Our shared values, equality and fairness, democracy and freedom, community and solidarity can provide both the basis for a critique of capitalism and help to guide us toward a socialist and democratic society. Eric Olin Wright has distilled decades of work into this concise and tightly argued manifesto, analyzing the varieties of anti-capitalism, assessing different strategic approaches, and laying the foundations for society dedicated to human flourishing. How to Be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century is an urgent and powerful argument for socialism and an unparalleled guide to help us get there. Another world is possible. How to Be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century by Eric Olin Wright with an afterword by Michael Burroway. Out now from Verso Books. The victories of, of national liberation movements beyond Palestine transformed both world and regional geopolitics. The number of UN member states went from 51 in 1945 to 138 by the time Yasser Arafat, the head of the Palestine Liberation Organization, made his first visit to the UN in 1974. How did the ascendance of the global south transform the Palestinian struggle's horizon of possibility? And how did the PLO seek to use that transformation that was underway to its advantage? This is really where I think, you know, the idea of Palestine as a political idea that continues to resonate today, especially, you know, amongst radical allies and friends in solidarity is planted. The ascendance of the Global South and membership in the United Nations created somewhat of an automatic voting block. And this was, and not only, it was not just, you know, numerical, it was also intellectual and political, where the former colonized nations are also organizing themselves. They're organizing themselves, we see in 1955 in Bandung, Indonesia. They're organizing themselves thereafter in a series of meetings that culminate in the non 
Align movement, as well as the G77 later, as well as, you know, different formations where this is not just about their numbers. This is about creating an alternative history for the world. And it's one where the bid for the future is you know, one where, where these, where these nations are not only independent, but where they're also free of debt to the global North so that they can, you know, and, and there's a redistribution of wealth. There's also an upending of racism, racism on the international level, um, um, and to international, to, to abolish racism in, in general. Um, so this is literally a fight for a new future and Palestinians, are stepping in to the foray and become very central to the story of how it happens because they're facing off uh, not just with Israel, but with the U.S. by proxy and are doing so in an organized fashion in 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 a disciplined fa- fa- fashion and in a committed fashion where they're also adopting a line of, you know, internationalism that becomes a part of their thinking. And so we see the PLO now in what uh, one of my interlocutors uh, describes as, you know, not the UN becomes a locus of battle, battle. It's not, we're not diplomats going to the United Nations, she describes, rather we're cadre, we're fighters who happen to be in the UN and the UN is an other side of that struggle. And, you know, in the story of the United Nations, we see that very clearly as the United States has a tremendous amount of anxiety that, you know, if the UN continues a pace as this site of revolt, that what's at stake is, is their global hegemony is the hegemony of the global north and of former uh, colonial powers. And so, you know, the status of the UN is also put into question as these new actors not only are coming into power, but are also changing the rules. And so one of the things that I document is when Abdelaziz Bouteflika, who was the foreign minister of Algeria at the time and becomes the General Assembly president under his reign, literally changes the UN rules in order to be able to expel South Africa as a member state in the face of French, British, and U.S. intransigence, which had basically stemmed the, you know, global consensus that South Africa was a violator for its apartheid, you know, its racist practices. And and the U.S., the U.K., and France basically would block their expulsion to say that that should be a measure of last resort and it's too extreme. And under the leadership of Bouteflika, the UN changes the rules and says, okay, well, we don't need a Security Council uh, resolution in order to um, unseat them from the United Nations. And they do that successfully. So that's like a small anecdote of, of this very revolutionary time where at the UN, these different cadre are are restructuring a new world order at the same time that on the ground, they're also engaged in national liberation warfare. But participating in these four, are you right, also risked, risked legitimating the state of Israel and hedging Palestinians into a fragmented rub, rump state by at least either implicitly or explicitly acknowledging the partition of Palestine as legitimate. And this was something that the PLO was very divided over internally between its its various factions. And it was a risk, you write, that was ultimately realized in the signing of the Oslo Accords and the PLO adopting what you call, quote, a politics of diplomatic respectability. Which didn't have to be that way. Those are two separate things. The track of accepting the partition of Palestine and the track of not only domestic you know, that's one way, diplomatic respectability. Another one is is to frame it as a a politics of acquiescence. Those aren't the same thing. They become collapsed in that way under the Oslo framework. I'm going to put a pin in that. And let me just start in this risk. There's two things about the risk. One is the historical context and how it creates this bifurcation, which is the fact that after the October 1973 war, it basically became clear that the two largest Arab armies, Egypt and Syria, were not going to ever go into a full war of liberation against Israel to to liberate Palestine. 
conventional war was off the table after October 1973. In addition to, to that reality is the fact that it's also clear that Arabs can be victors, which, you know, and this is what precipitates the Middle East peace process, which basically puts into motion the 1967 resolution, which had laid dormant between 67 and 73. And so now there's this new political reality that, you know, Arabs can negotiate to get their lands back, the, the Sinai, the Golan Heights and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Both of those realities precipitate together that the reality that there will be no conventional war of liberation and that there, you know, there is this entryway of actual negotiations create a split within the PLO of a pragmatist front. They're self-described as the pragmatists who see, uh, or pragmatists, excuse me, who see that the establishment of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza as either an interim or a final resolution to the question of Palestine. Um, and the rejection is... And that's led by Fatah. That is led by Fatah, yes. I mean, not all... Fa- like, Fatah is also... I mean, sure. within Fatah, there's also a disagreement. This, but, so it's, it's led by the pragmatist front of Fatah, which is led by uh, Yasser Arafat. And then there's the rejectionist front, which is led by the PFLP, or the Popul- Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is rejecting this as, as even a slight possibility and wants to continue a national armed struggle until liberation. And so here you have, you know, the understory to this, to the height of the Palestinian revolutionary years is this tension. And in is this reality that's built, which is the consideration of, on the one hand, are we ever really going to win this through armed liberation? And on the other hand, is it even possible? What gains are there to be made through negotiations and through diplomacy? Now, at so that these are like, and then there's an, a number of other political considerations. Egypt is it's very clear Egypt's going to enter into you know the, the diplomatic negotiations. It's very clear that the U.S. is is going to exclude the PLO. Um, there's a balance of power changing. Jordan is still a threat to Palestinian sovereignty. And so that's another side of battle. The Palestinians have been removed from Jordan and have relocated to, to Lebanon. So there's a number of factors that are influencing the political internal political thinking of the PLO. Now add to it, it's one of the reasons when the when the PLO realized, or Yasser Arafat, I should say, according to Nabil Shaf, uh, who was his advisor at the time and who I interviewed as an interlocutor, and I should pause and say here that so much of this wasn't available. Like this history, even as I was trying to unearth it, wasn't readily available. And much of the work that I had to do was to reconstruct um, as much as I could through living interlocutors. And so, you know, in my interviews with Nabil Shaf, he explains to me, that Yasser Arafat, having understood that he, the PLO was going to be excluded from the Middle East peace process, wanted then to you know take the fight elsewhere and take the fight to the United Nations. But taking the fight to the United Nations, you know, came with this set of you know these set of norms that hadn't been explicitly discussed, which you know includes the norm of territorial sovereignty and national and non-intervention that basically enshrines Israel's sovereignty. And so the the risk of entering into this place is you are oh and then the other risk is not only having to accept Israel's sovereignty within this framework assuming that anybody was going to you know actually take that at face value but it was also the risk of the fact that Palestinians hadn't really declared themselves they they described themselves as a national liberation movement but didn't never declared themselves as a state in exile or as a government in exile because they didn't want to recognize Israel as a political reality they and and that they felt that if they ever do that 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 would be a last negotiating chip that they use and so now there's this other conflict of what is the PLO at the United Nations and what exactly is it fighting for when it's fighting for national liberation is it just to liberate the west bank in gaza or is it to liberate all of palestine and part of the conflict and and for the PLO it was very clear that they were going to liberate all of Palestine but within the United Nations there wasn't that wasn't the that wasn't always an explicit norm and there was a lot of confusion on that point according to you know the meeting minutes so that the PLO enjoyed a considerable amount of support 
because of those member states who felt that it should Palestine should be a state, but that bo- that that group of states included the states that believed that it should you know be completely independent, that it should liberate all of Palestine, all Palestinian lands, including those occupied before 1967. And those states that just were talking about post-1967. And that was the gray area. And for Palestinians and the PLO, this was a site of battle. This was a place where they were they were about to create a legal alternative to Resolution 242, whereas 242 enshrined their juridical erasure and ensured Israel's uh, ensured Israel as a political reality. Three, resolution 3236, together with Resolution 3237, basically created a pathway to negotiations where Palestinian, where they did not have to recognize Israel and they established the Palestinians as a juridical people, right? So, and at the same time, though, there's this the, the, the tension and the confusion is not coming to the forefront because Palestinians are just fighting for a seat at the table. The PLO is just fighting to be seen and to be recognized. And for the Palestinians to be recognized as a people and for the PLO to be recognized as their legitimate representative. And they do that with the world community in 1974, but the U.S. and Israel remain intransigent that they won't recognize them. And, and yet here's the U.S. that's primarily driving the Middle East peace process that excludes the PLO and Israel refuses to acknowledge uh, the PLO and begins to think about how they're going to acknowledge a local Palestinian representatives who, who can represent themselves in, in negotiations for self-autonomy, but not for national liberation. So th- the debates, the debates and this logic that become, you know, that just simmers under the surface don't come to the fore because what's at stake is the PLO being seen, is the PLO being recognized, is the PLO having a seat at the table. And so we don't, you know, during this revolutionary period, it's not happening at the forefront. And why for somebody like me, who goes back as a researcher, to want to understand these historical debates, I first approach this as this is this is the high moment, and in, indeed it is. It is a high moment of uh, a number of palace, monumental Palestinian victories, but it's also a moment of defeat. It's a moment when it becomes clear what are the parameters of this discussion, what it means to use international law as a framework. International law. Ha- very much, you know, developed as a result of the work of of uh, national liberation movements and uh, newly independent states. Developed a body of law, condemned colonialism, and that charted a pathway for you know national liberation and and freedom. But it it has a blind spot when it comes to settler colonialism. There is nothing in that body of law, in international law, that created a framework for settler decolonization, which, and and that's where I think question of Palestine falls out the bottom, where our struggle is one against settler decolonization, you know, settler colonization, and yet it's been, it's being refracted as an anti-colonial struggle, which assumes that the colonizer will go back to a metropole where their sovereignty is intact, except in Israel, the settler traveled with their sovereignty and intended to stay. And so how do you remove them? And this is what, you know, these are the things that I think we're also continuing to grapple with. One of Zionism's most powerful ideological victories has been reframing the situation from a struggle against colonialism to, in its kind of, I guess, a liberal variant, a, a conflict between two peoples who want one land. How did that happen? And what role did Oslo and the promise of a two-state solution play? Well, I think this framework of national, um, right, this idea of of two peoples over one land as opposed to, you know, a settler colonial um, situation, we see the seeds planted for that from, from the very beginning as Israel, um, as Zionists are insisting in the drafting of the Palestine Mandate in 1922 that the, that the native population, that the native Arab population who want to be in an independent Palestine are not recognized as native in the text. So there's no discussion of natives because they want to reserve that language for themselves and for whom they consider um, a Jewish diaspora that is native and, and will return. 
right? And so what happens in interwar years is that we basically see Palest- the, the question of Palestine transformed into a humanitarian issue of, of displaced refugees who are forcibly exiled. In the aftermath of 1967, we see it transformed into a national liberation movement of a people fighting for their homeland. And it's at this point that we see, you know, we're not seeing Israel cede any any of that argument. To the contrary, during this moment, they start to argue that this is, that the establishment of Israel is the realization of Jewish self-determination and that that's their human right. And just like all these other nations that are fighting to be self-determined, Jews too are fighting for their self-determination, which they say without any irony as they ally themselves with the United States and Portugal who are two of the primary colonial powers in the world and who are actually part of, you know, are constitutive of an, an imperial pillar against the National Liberation Armies. It's, and, and so that's why for most of the third world, um, the NAM, the G77, and, you know, those who are in struggle, it's not a que- they never really deal with the question of Jewish self-determination. They don't take it seriously. Israel is part of the is part of the enemy. They're the ones that are funding South Africa. They're the ones aligned with the United States. They're the ones that, you know, are aligned with Portugal and using the same legal arguments, you know, about self-defense and and are the ones that are arguing that guerrillas are terrorists and not combatants. So it's it's just a, it's a no-brainer that they are not. This is they're not on the same side. They're not fighting uh for the same future. What happens in the aftermath of 1982 and the expulsion of the PLO from Lebanon basically because you know creates a new set of political realities where the PLO is the PLO's power is diminishing significantly and you know it no longer has a base in Lebanon can no longer launch cross border raids it no longer has you know some 300 to 400,000 Palestinian refugees who are constitutive of its you know institutional and bureaucratic body and it's it's slowly losing favor with arab governments who see it as uh, who see Arafat as as less and less desirable, and this uh, comes to full fruition in the Gulf War when Arafat, you know, signals his support for Saddam Hussein in the after the occupation of Kuwait, and that then creates you know a new set of of realities for the PLO. Now it's it's no longer in the same position to negotiate and to fight, and begins to contemplate the two-state solution as a pathway to freedom. Not the two-state solution as has been articulated by Oslo, but the two-state solution as literally a pathway to freedom of basically, you know, we can still claim the right of return even as we, you know, establish a Palestinian state in the West Bank, in Gaza. The idea is that, you know, somewhat along the lines of 181, because the PLO now is actually, it endorses 181, for partition and it endorses 242 after two decades of rejecting it and imagines something similar where 181, and this is what's lost in, in, you know, the contemporary political discussion on this issue or diplomatic discussion anyway. 181 never imagined an exclusive Jewish and, and an exclusive Arab state, but always imagined that the, the each of these states would be multilingual and multinational and cultural, and that there would be minority protections for those who weren't Jewish or who weren't Palestinian in, the, in what became established as the respective states, according to the partition plan of 47. And so for Palestinians, um, as they adopt and, and basically outline uh, or endorse the two-state solution and and write a declaration of Palestinian independence and say that Palestine will exist in the West Bank with East Jerusalem as its capital and, and the Gaza Strip and it'll be one entity somehow. Yes, this reflected a position, you know, a different position, a position of, of, of relative weakness, but it also reflected, you know, the culmination of the pragmatist vision that we can't win this militarily um, and we should approach this diplomatically and we'll establish our state along, you know, in, in this truncated area. And there wasn't revolt. This was, by and large, the PNC, the Palestinian National Council, voted for this. The fallout that happens, happens as a result of Oslo, 
not as a result of two states. And one of the things that's really frustrating for me is that even though I, I don't believe in two states, so I'm not defending it, but I'm, I'm still frustrated by a discourse that collapses the Oslo peace process and the two state solution um, into a single entity. And those aren't the same thing. Because Oslo never even made the possibility in practice, at least, of, of two states possible. First of all, there's nothing in the documents that even says a Palestinian state. There's nothing in the preambular text. There's nothing in the text itself of the Declaration of Principles. There's nothing in the 1995 interim agreement. There's nothing in the subsequent agreement that ever says that the outcome of this process will be the establishment of a Palestinian state. I mean, that's just from the get. We understand. So for me, as a critical scholar looking at this and for other critical analysts and scholars and activists looking at this, what Oslo is, is basically... The 1978 um, framework agreement negotiated by Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin leading up to the Egyptian-Israeli peace accord in 1979 that basically promises that Palestinians will be autonomous but never sovereign. And so that's what Oslo is. Oslo is not, you know, the promise of, of the establishment of a state. Oslo is the pr promise of the establishment of autonomy. And so Israel is able to consolidate all of its gains. And in fact, the text is almost verbatim. It, you know, it outlines a five-year process, a two-year interim process, then a final status negotiations process. You know, in 1978, the difference between the 78 text and the 93 text is that where in 78, the, the stewards of the process will be the you know, Palestinians who are locally elected in 93, it's the PLO itself, which Arafat sees as his greatest victory. And the other significant distinction is that whereas in 78, it was a guarantee of, of jurisdiction over people, Palestinian people, in 93, it was jurisdiction over certain uh, of Palestinian people and certain areas of land that they exist on but not jurisdiction of, of over the West Bank and Gaza, which would have meant that the settlements would have come under Palestinian jurisdiction. And that's a whole other thing. I mean, anything, I don't want to get into the legal, you know, details of, of the Oslo Accords. Um, I think, one, when I started the research, I thought that, that that's what I was going to do, which was just to describe how bad the terms were. And I realized you don't need to be a lawyer to understand how bad the terms are. Because they're You just need to be oh, literate. Horrible. <laughs> They're, and, and they're self on their face, their whole. And so the big question for me became, why, why would the PLO enter into this, and how did Israel consolidate all of its territorial takings within this framework, and do it with Palestinian acquiescence, and basically shift the balance of power, and and now a, appear as if it was. You know, it was just in this was just about peace and conflict and negotiations between two parties trying to get along. That becomes the focus of my my research there as a result of that. What What's masterful is that Oslo facilitates this deep entrenchment of a pre-existing system of domination that's existed since 1948 and before. And then is sold. Oslo is then sold, though, as the thing that will undo that domination. Right, right. So it's, 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 but, and, but here's the thing, right? You know, so much of Palestinian mythology around Oslo is that Palestinian negotiators went without maps. They weren't ready. They, there was a language hindrance and whatnot. And, you know, that is definitely part of the story. But there were a set of negotiators in Madrid and in Washington that were very adept. There were legal advisors, including Reza Shade, who's one of the most, you know, he's a preeminent legal scholar, an advocate, is one of the founders of Al-Haq, which is a premier human rights organization, Palestinian human rights organization. He was there. It included, you know, advisors like Rashid Khalidi. It included Haider Abd shafi and Hanan Ashrawi and others. They knew what they were doing. They might have been outflanked. The terms might have sucked, but they knew what they were doing and were avoiding the entrapments that Israel was setting up. It was Arafat's singular desire to achieve an agreement and to achieve Israeli recognition of the PLO, which was seen as a tantamount achievement, which is what creates this back channel in Norway, 
where they're the negotiators who are three, who go without the maps, who do not understand the language, um, well, do not have a master, you know, a mastery of English or of, of the law. They don't have a legal advisor. They're the ones who then enter into this agreement and are accepting all of the terms that the negotiator, Palestinian negotiators in Washington are rejecting. And it sets us up in the situation that becomes our trap. It is our trap. Now, some, I'm going to be fair, right? Like if you want to provide the best argument for, for why then would Arafat do this, you know, the best argument I can think of is that they had reached a point where they were relatively, the PLO was relatively weak. Its existence was on the line. They had tried national liberation, you know, armed struggle for two decades and it hadn't, you know, it had certainly placed them on the map and created allies and solidarity, but it hadn't liberated an inch of land. Here was this agreement where 9,000 Palestinians were going to be able to return home, right? Where they were actually going to be on this territory and where they were going to be able to fly the Palestinian flag, you know, and be on the, you know, on this pathway to independence. And so that's probably the best argument that they could make, which is they were able to achieve far more, you know, in these terms than armed liberation was able to achieve. And yet, and I, and I, I could have sympathy for that for about seven, maybe 10 years by 2000, when the peace process collapses horribly, for the first time in the aftermath of Camp David and the eruption of what's known as the Al-Aqsa Intifada or the second Palestinian Intifada, which I think both are misnomers. But in any case, what became clear is that even under a labor government, they were going to continue settlement expansion. Settlements increased by 100% under the leadership of Ahud Barak. We understand that the, that the, interim, that the interim agreement is actually looks like it's going to be a permanent status agreement, that there would be no mechanism to hold Israel to account. The U.S. as the only broker was not an honest broker, but was playing a role of protecting Israel and ensuring that it can um, continue apace, that the Palestinians who were being trained and being lightly armed were being lightly armed to protect the settlers against the Palestinians and not the Palestinians against Israelis um, or against external aggression. And even in the West Bank's case, to put down protests in the West Bank against Israeli assaults on Gaza. Which becomes really clear, right, after 2009, it becomes the most clear that the security arrangement and and the security coordination between Israel and Palestinians is basically creating some sort of a double occupation for Palestinians where they're living both under a Palestinian police quasi state and then the Israeli you know military regime and so that becomes clear but even by 2000 the writing was on the wall the writing was on the wall and so as much and by 2005 it was over Arafat had been besieged. Um, the peace process was dead. You know, at the, from 2005 onwards, so we're talking about, you know, we're, we're inching up on 15 years. From 2005 onwards, we've basically been living, holding up this peace process on stilts. It's a fantasy. And to the extent that we're holding it up, it's only harmed Palestinians. And Palestinians who are holding it up are holding it up for a variety of reasons. The Palestinian official leadership is holding it up you know, one, because they, you know, they see that there's no other alternative. From 1973 onwards, they tried to get a direct channel with the United States. They finally get it in 19, you know, 88. And so now why, if they abandon it, there's no other option. Um, they also don't see any other option in general. They've become incredibly dependent on external funding. Uh, the public sector is bloated and there is no Palestinian economy to speak of. So they're dependent on, you know, external funding, which is tantamount, frankly, to national charity. And so not continuing a pace would mean, you know, the public sector collapsing and no alternative. You know, and then there's the, the, the other reasons, you know, that people might give of there's um, the there could just be corruption or fatalism. They're, they're not going to win, so they might as well get what they can before, you know, they die for them and their families. I mean, and that's the most cynical approach. Um, but for, you know, a confluence of all these reasons, Palestinians have been, Palestinian official leadership has been part of uh, the maintenance of this farce, of a peace process. Even as Netanyahu, 
has told the international audience over and over and over again, there will be no Palestinian state, even as Trump has come into office and, and basically recognized, you know, said that Jerusalem is uh, comes under Israeli sovereignty and the Golan Heights come under Israeli sovereignty and Israel has declared sovereignty order over the Jordan Valley. Even as they defund UNRWA, $364 million of UNRWA, and shut the PLO mission office in Washington, D.C. I mean... Come on. The writing has been on the wall for 15 years. And now Israel and the United States said, you know, deals up, jokes on you. And here we have the Palestinian official leadership basically waiting out the Trump administration and waiting out Netanyahu. That's what they're doing. This is our current state of affairs. And we can't even have that discussion because we are still trapped by this in you know peace process industry where diplomats entire careers are built on this and journalists frankly don't study the issue and are afraid to touch it because you can't criticize it if you step outside the bounds of it and and so we can't have an honest discussion and if you have the discussion with Palestinians this is you know they're beyond this altogether they really want to discuss the crisis of leadership and the crisis of a Palestinian leadership and how to get past this and and what are alternatives are available to us to do that it's really it's what's really really frustrating is the vast space and the vast gap between the public discourse on this issue and Palestinians in the United States are so grateful for any inch we get to even talk about it because part of you know the structure of oppression has been to make this a taboo um, but even in the public discourse it's still not it there's not enough space to have, you know, the real discussion of what next? Really, what next? You know, once we convince everybody of, of our reality, of how, you know, what this is and what it looks like, are we ready for the next step of what next? Of what we do when people believe us? <laughs> well, in terms of what next, that's my next question, which is you write that, that BDS, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, has been enormously successful at challenging Israel, but you also write that its rights-based and non-political framework has limitations. What has BDS succeeded in doing and what else needs to happen to supplement it? You write that coercion is necessary to change the basic political dynamic, but that armed struggle is currently not viable. What coercion then might work? How might Palestinians, as you write, quote, challenge the political structure that that, that declared and has sustained the sovereign exception? So I'm going to I'm going to, you know, divide those into two questions, because one is about coercion and the other one is about BDS as a form of coercion and what are its virtues and its limits. So on the first count on coercion, as we discussed earlier, and as I've described right now, in terms of where we're, you know, the Oslo framework and what I describe as a sovereignty trap, which is basically a native people demonstrating its eligibility for sovereignty, that then the settler sovereign has to provide to them, but which is never going to be complete, right? We're, we're, we're performing, we're demonstrating that we're eligible to govern ourselves and that Israel can be safe if Palestinians are self-governing on the hope that somehow Israel is then going to afford us, is just going to give us independence once we've proven ourselves good enough to do that, right? This is a trap. And all we're getting is, you know, self-autonomy in the form of Bantustans in, into shrinking space. We're not going to be independent. Our reliance on settler sovereign recognition is the trap itself. We don't need settler sovereign recognition. We don't need Israel to recognize us in order to be free because their recognition of its, excuse me, the state's recognition of us is basically what makes our existence contingent on their approval. And they get to decide what, how much we can exist. So, you know, that, so how do we exceed that trap? And part of that trap has been, you know, in order to prove eligibility, we have to prove that Israel can live with us, which means that we have to be acquiescent. We have to do everything that they've asked for, which, you know, the government and Palestinian leadership in the West Bank has done. Which was the basis of U.S. and Israeli policy since, I believe, 1975, was basically 
capitu- total capitulation as a condition for negotiations. Absolutely, which they outline in, in the 1975 MOU or Memorandum of Understanding that basically outlines what would what they would concede um, or what would be necessary for Palestinians to even be, you know, um, within this framework, right? Or, or to negotiate at all. And so, yes, exactly. This is complete capitulation. And let's just, if you want to make the argument again, make the best argument for the Palestinian official leadership. And the best argument they can, you can make is they wanted to try acquiescence. Let us prove that we are the desirable neighbor, the good neighbor and the good partner. Lay down our arms. They did it. They disarmed all Palestinian factions They in the West Bank. They have tortured Palestinians in, in, in Palestinian detention centers and facility. They have turned over Palestinians that Israel has wanted and turned them over into Israeli captivity, almost through a revolving door from Palestinian prisons to Israeli prisons. And they've sat back while Israel massacres civilians in, in Gaza, which is premised on this disaggregation of, of the occupied territories into two zones, one PA, Palestinian Authority controlled, and the other this conflict short of war, hostile entity that anything can be done to. <laughs> and that's another, right? That's a whole other discussion, and a whole other <sighs> chapter. But suffice it to say that it's the this, this, you know, this this watching Gaza be pummeled and destroyed in and and really the internecine conflict between Fatah and Hamas and the articulation amongst the Palestinian official leadership as Hamas being its primary, you know, obstacle and enemy as opposed to to Israel and Israel's domination is the darkest chapter, one of the darkest chapters of our history. And so, yes, that's, we've done, you know, what le- what, what, what else can Abbas do in the West Bank to prove that he is the good partner, that he, he's even said, I don't even claim Safad as my homeland. I have no right to return. I am now from Ramallah. I mean, what else? He's basically demonstrated that counter, you know how they say, well, we don't know the counterfactual. In this case, we know the Palestinian counterfactual of disarmament and of complete acquiescence. And what Abbas has gotten in return has been the wall, the completion of the wall, the annex, you know, the, the annexation of Jerusalem and the declaration of sovereignty, a promise to annex the Jordan Valley, and ex- you know, a, a declaration that there will never be a Palestinian state and that there will be negotiations, no negotiations. That's been the the, the outcome. We see the and a dra- and a dramatic expansion in the legitimation of Israeli violence against civilians, as if it wasn't already dramatically expansive before. Just. Uh, Anything is possible. All of this is happening as a result. And and so I describe this as, you know, this politics of acquiescence that we've tried for over 25 years. And at this point, what's necessary is a politics of resistance and coercion. And because what, you know, and, and you're alluding to this because of, you know, now pal- there is just no international context to use armed force as before. It would be so out of place and out of time, Israel for, you know, we can't, even though international law is totally on the Palestinian side of, of the use of force to target military installations, to target, you know, armed soldiers and armed, you know, units and different military installation, Israel has also done a number on the laws of war, on the laws of war, so that even when Palestinians target military soldiers and, and installations, even that's described as terroristic and criminal. So it, there's, so what I, you know, here's where I introduce that, you know, there's other forms of coercion. And one of the most significant forms has been the BDS movement, which is, you know, a form of resistance and a form of coercion. But as you articulate also, the reason that I think that, you know, I articulated, you know, and this is legal logic of being necessary but insufficient is because BDS is a human rights movement. BDS is a solidarity movement. BDS is not a national liberation movement. It doesn't articulate Palestinian what Palestinian freedom looks like. It doesn't articulate um, a process of settler decolonization. It doesn't articulate of what a future with uh, Jewish Israelis looks like. It doesn't articulate, you know, how we should organize ourselves. It very clearly says that whatever those outcomes are, they should be predicated on these rights-based norms. 
And they say that because the excise of the, you know, it's a corrective to the Oslo peace process, which basically excised all reference to human rights norms and international law and all of the um, international law victories throughout the 1970s. But then the other thing that the BDS and the leadership of BDS, BNC says, is that we're not a political body. We're not elected. This is not our place to then decide what the future of Palestine is. They say that explicitly. They're That's not the, the new the PLO. P- they're not the no P- new PLO. They're, they're not, not supplanting the, PLO. the PLO. And so here you have, you know, and so this is this is my, you know, and again, this is nuance. I definitely, definitely support BDS. And I also think it's necessary, um, but insufficient. And so they create the political space and the room to walk through. They've created enough controversy for us. I mean, one of the greatest things that the BDS movement has done in the United States has been to make this a public conversation. Let's talk about it. And that political space is so important in the United States because it is the primary financier and provider uh, provider of arms to Israel. And so we have to have this conversation here. Um, and and so it's we, the guarantor of the exception. It is. It is the. It is the primary pillar of the political status quo that has maintained that has maintained the exception. And so, but we need some we need some politics to come through. We need some politics to take up that space. There's you know internally amongst Palestinians, there has been disdain for international law because you know it's seen as as in it's not effective. It's not effective. It's not born anything. It takes up too much space. We're not a human rights issue. We're we're a political, we're a political movement. And I've, you know, I've countered. I see what you mean, but I don't think the problem is the law. I think the problem is the lack of politics. The law is taking up a disproportionate amount of force, space. Excuse me, um, as a language where there is no politics to take up that space. And so, how do we produce that political language? And that's really that's really the task ahead. That's really the task ahead for Palestinians. And the way that I articulate it is that if we can have this conversation and if we can imagine that future of one that exceeds national sovereignty as a framework for, you know, freedom forward, that we would be answering some questions not only for us as Palestinians, but we would be answering a lot of questions for communities across the globe, for the entire world. We are, you know, the largest and longest standing refugee population. But answering, you know, the the crisis of Palestinian refugees, can we provide an answer to that crisis? To, you know, which is crazy to call it a crisis given how long it is. But can we provide a solution to the Palestinian refugees that wouldn't just be a solution f- for Palestinians, but for other refugees? What are mod- What are different global models of inclusion? What are different ways of thinking of, you know, being in a place beyond citizenship, but thinking about belonging that would allow us to reconceive of who has the right to stay, who has the right to be? And I do think that, you know, Palestinians are are in that place to be answering these questions and to be providing that. And I say that with a lot of anxiety because, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of comfort to be able to do, you know, that that radical imagination work, to do that freedom dreaming. And I recognize I was just in Palestine and it's devastating. Every day the situation is worse. Every day the space has shrunk even more. Every day repression heightens, collective punishment heightens. The Palestinians have a saying that Israelis have mastered an artistry of cruelty in terms of, you know, um, how Palestinians are treated. And so, you know, it's hard to imagine that kind of future with a boot on your neck. And yet that's precisely our challenge. And that's, you know, it's not just to resist this moment, but it's to, re- to resist this moment and to imagine what comes after it so that we don't put ourselves in the next trap that might be waiting for us. Well, Nura Erekat, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Nura Erekat is a Palestinian human rights attorney and professor at Rutgers, New Brunswick. She is a co-founding board member of Jadalia Ezain, an editorial board member of the Journal of Palestine Studies, and the author of Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine, 
As Marx once said, after noting that the profound hypocrisy and inherent barbarism of bourgeois civilization lies unveiled before our eyes, turning from its home, where it assumes respectable forms, to the colonies, where it goes naked. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world, in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis. Music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinators are Julia Rock and Zachary Nin. Our senior advisor is Thea Rio Francos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio. And please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe to the show. If it's on iTunes or wherever, also please leave us a nice review. Those reviews, it is our understanding, help introduce us to new listeners. But really, what really, truly does that is you telling other people about the show in person, on social media, however. Please make propaganda for us. And do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this show up and running strong. Even a few bucks is a huge help. 